everyone, and welcome back to our virtual speaker series, our December 2023 edition. This will be the last one of the year. And we are thrilled to announce that we will have, we have welcoming back. Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> Uh, I need to mute that. Uh, we'll, so uh, we have uh, Will Harris and David Moscato of the Common Descent Podcast. I, mm -hmm. They're amazing people who have volunteered to come and talk to us and tell us about how Jurassic Park is a terrible zoo. Uh, <laughs> Will and David are the hosts of the Common Descent Podcast, which is an online uh, discussion about where they talk about different dinosaurs, paleontology, geology, all sorts of different topics. And every episode is a different one. They talk about about an hour each time. And they go over some of the new paleontological news and explore things. And it is an amazing podcast. I'd highly recommend it. Uh, you can search it up where you find wherever you find your podcasts. And uh, also on commondescent.com or commondescentpodcast.com. Um, but Will and David are paleontologists and science communicators coming out of Tennessee, uh, focusing on crocodiles and snakes respectively uh, choose your favorite and the and they will point out i'm sure at some point in the many discussions about which is better i won't i won't open that kind of worms uh, but i think with that i will let will and david take it away all right thank you very much uh welcome everybody thanks for coming to join us uh thanks to the crew at uh the museum for inviting us to do these we have a lot of fun uh, like Jackson said, we are paleontologists. Mm -hmm. uh, we're big fans of dinosaurs and fossils and all sorts of stuff. We are also, and this is true of a lot of paleontologists, uh, big nerds. Yes. Uh, big fans of pop culture, -y stuff, as, as you can see. Yes, we like fossil stuff and also <laughs> we like uh, pop culture and nerdy stuff. Uh, and we are big fans of Jurassic Park. A bit. Uh, we, we do quite like Jurassic Park. We are sure that uh, those of you who have come to a talk with the title that this talk has, uh, there are probably lots of people in the chat here who are fans of Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, the franchise as a whole. With good reason. With good reason. Jurassic Park, awesome movie, very fun. Uh, we quite enjoy it. We do, however, <laughs> have uh, a criticism that is going to be the center of this presentation what, whatever there is to be said about the movies themselves the park mm -hmm. the world the amusement park the theme park the zoo the thing that is built in the films does not go well no uh i think that i don't is, think that that's a controversial statement. i don't think that's controversial <laughs> i think that any professional uh in a relevant field would agree uh that that was a failure of an entertainment venue yes uh lots of people got eaten uh, probably a major loss of money mm -hmm. uh, once all the lawsuits are done. Uh, did not did not go for it. Now, if you were to ask uh, people, if you were to ask some of the people in the movies, if you were to ask some of the people in the audience, it feels like some people might be of the perspective that the reason it did that everything went wrong is because dinosaurs are too dangerous, that people were playing with forces beyond their control. Uh, we are here in today's presentation to express the opinion that that is not why uh, the park went wrong. Mm -mm. Uh, in our professional opinion, the reason that it went wrong is because Jurassic Park is a terrible zoo. Just the worst. <laughs> <laughs> they did a bad job doing a zoo. This presentation, we are going to go through some examples. We're, I like to think of us as the review board. Yeah, yeah. if we were to come in and with you our know, clipboards, rate, uh, go through the the credentials, review the footage of a, as an animal care facility. How are they doing? Uh, not well. Not well. So we're going to go through. We're going to review some of the evidence, and we're going to point out some of the places where maybe the zoo management uh, was a bit lacking uh, in the zoo. Now, this is not just us speaking uh, off the top of our heads. Yeah, like of our uh, personal opinions of what we would like a zoo to be. Right. There is actually, uh, there are guidelines for this. Yes. This is a thing in the real world. Will, you worked at a zoo slash aquarium mm -hmm. facility. Uh, if you would, wait. 
Ta-da! If there you would go. please explain where our rules are coming from. So when you are looking at zoos and aquariums, uh, there is an association called the AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, aptly named. This is a group that is mainly focused here in the U.S., but there is a national, uh, international version of it that has set guidelines based on research and evidence of how to care for various groups, species of animals. This goes over everything from the what food can they have to what their enclosure needs to be to what kind of care they need outside of those two, you know, medical or just day-to-day, -day, you know, interaction. How many animals should be grouped together? If you have this many animals, you need this much square footage. There's calculations. And this is for birds, fish, any type of thing you might keep in a zoo or aquarium. Yeah, basically, any animal you've seen at a zoo or an aquarium, there is some chapter in their set of rules about them. And if you go to a zoo that is part of that is following these guidelines, you'll see the AZA stamp yes. somewhere. You can be accredited, but it is very hard to become accredited because you need to follow these rules precisely. So if you see that, that means these animals are being cared for at near the top level they could be. And, you know, of course, there's always higher. You can go with excess money, sure. uh, but that they this are being like cared. restaurant ratings. Yes. So it's like, yes, we had a we had a person come through here like Ratatouille. Somebody yes. came in and they have rated this place. So if you don't see that, that means that they aren't following the guides well enough to be accredited. They might not be doing a horrific job, but they aren't doing something right or they're missing something to get that title. This is the seal of a good and potentially even excellent zoo or aquarium. Now, if I remember correctly, uh, in the book Jurassic Park, there is... A, so Jurassic Park originally uh, in the story is built on an island off the coast of Costa Rica. And I think there's a line in the book somewhere about how that was on purpose yeah. to be in a place where the government isn't as restrictive about this kind of stuff. Yep. So it was kind of built into the original story that we're... Uh, maybe uh, cutting some corners. This is all this darn red tape <laughs> stopping them from making dinosaurs. So let's go through a couple of the more uh, glaring problems yes. that came up uh, with this zoo. As we go through these, uh, take a look. See what you can think of uh, that you might uh, have a to critique about this place as a zoo. We'll talk a bit, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll have time for questions, and you can tell us what sort of stuff you thought. Now, uh, in reviewing the footage, uh, I want to start with uh, perhaps the most famous uh, uh, error Yes, that seems to have happened. So what's going on here at this point in the movie is that the power has gone out, mm -hmm. and this animal, uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, has managed to go uh, through the fencing, the wire fencing, the uh, 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 electrified. Yes wire fencing uh, because the power went out uh, and the electrified fence is no longer electrified. Clearly not an ideal situation. Mm -mm. Uh, well, what stands out to you about uh, this scene as a, uh, in terms of oversight? Uh, well, I mean, the, the definitely the first thing to notice is the animals on the wrong side of the fence. Um, <laughs> that's, that's This is not the side you want this that's, animal to be. That's the opposite side. The biggest issue here is not that you know their security or something was lacking here that you know that that a single person was able to sabotage them it's that they had but one line of failing for the animal to get out of the enclosure right. the only thing keeping that animal away from the jeeps on the path was this electrified yes. fencing which by the way in, oh, inhumane already uh, not that's ADA not compliant. the way that you want to do that you're not supposed to be electrocuting your animals when you are taking care of animals at a zoo or an aquarium their health comfort and well-being are your top priority end of sentence unless they are putting a guest in danger right that's the only time you get to in, put those aside slightly in this scenario both the animal and the guest are being put in danger. So we Oops. don't we don't use electricity, you know, <laughs> high voltage shock therapy to keep the animals in line. There's much easier ways. Uh first off, with an animal this size, we've been keeping large animals in zoos. You could have just dug a moat. You could have just dug a deep area around the habitat. Shall I go to the I think so. Uh, All right. Uh yeah, we could do this. You could just dig around it 
and make it so that the T-Rex can't reach the fence. Uh, you also could have just used thick acrylic, mm -hmm. which no matter what the T-Rex do, it's not going to get through it. And then people can see it and you don't have ugly wires in the way. It can be easy to forget that here in the real world, we do keep animals uh, that are not too dissimilar from a T-Rex in captivity. Yes. Here in the picture, we've got an elephant, a mo which elephants are T-Rex sized. Yes, that's a very uh, similar weight category. No less potentially dangerous. Uh, and a moat is is plenty to keep an elephant at bay. We also keep orcas yes. in captivity. Very smart animals, very powerful animals. Very smart carnivorous. Mm -hmm. uh, very similar in many ways. And they also uh, live in a place that's not our element. Yes, exactly. Uh, we can do it. We can do We have the techniques and the technology to accomplish it. So it's it's once again, the movie presents that what went wrong here was, you know, a, a sense of ego. What went wrong is that you had bad enclosures yes you even These if the power enclosures yeah if the power goes off with a good zoo enclosure it doesn't matter you might not be able to like get in through if you have like key locked doors and like stuff like that you might be in trouble in that way but the animal is going to stay inside because yes. you made a good enclosure so uh strike one yep uh, uh recommendation number one uh better enclosures better enclosures better enclosures let's move on uh to another scenario so, so I love this one so much. This is uh, early in the movie. In fact, uh, the opening scene of the of the film. The uh, what's happening here is that the park employees are moving one of the velociraptors. So this is a new raptor that uh, hasn't been entered into the raptor enclosure yet. So they are transporting it from one place uh, into the enclosure, and they've got it in this big box that they wheel over and they open the gate and then it goes in there and then uh, if you've seen the film you may recall that the velociraptor inside manages to shove the thing and it pushes it and then a guy falls over and then he starts getting eaten and then everybody has to jump uh to the rescue uh well everybody has to try to jump to <laughs> yes, the yes spoiler alert doesn't go well doesn't go well for that guy nope uh and then that's why the lawyer has to show up. yes exactly now i uh am appalled yeah, as a as a as the as the stand-in for a zoo person, <laughs> I am appalled. Well, that, so first, the the very first image of this <laughs> is is your problem right there. You don't need a gun. <laughs> uh, this is and that, that guy's got like some sort of cattle prod or yeah, something. We got semi, we got fully automatic and semi-automatic weapons. Uh, None of those are shooting tranquilizers. No. Those are just guns. Those are just guns. That's never... An you're, electrocution. You're not going to find those locked up that's, somewhere on a zoo's That's not premises. how you handle uh, wildlife. We don't use lethal techniques <laughs> uh, with our animals when we're moving them. Once again, this is portrayed as like, oh, but the, the raptor is so... We move tigers mm -hmm. and large apes and crocodiles all the time there are ways to do it and not once do we have to have a weapon <laughs> holstered and ready to go in case they act up so how would we do it if we needed to move uh something like a raptor by far the easiest solution here is teach the animal teach the animal what you want them to do and teach them how to behave in these scenarios by training them mm -hmm. that's that's your biggest uh tool to use is you can train animals so we use training in zoos and aquariums all the time. Usually for feeding is what you'll see most commonly of come to this spot, get your food. Come to this spot, get your food. But what that teaches them is the ability to come here and now we can like weigh you or get check you up. But we can also teach you to follow this target. That's how you know your spot. Follow this target into the cage. Mm -hmm. Follow this target out of the cage. That... We can do it with things like alligators, which are not known for their incredible problem-solving skills. Right. I like the three examples mm -hmm. that are on this slide because uh, one of them is a very large predator. Yes. Our polar bear over there, like Velociraptor. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Would outweigh the Velociraptor. <laughs> one of them is a bird, which are very closely related to Velociraptors. And the other is uh, alligator, which are also quite closely related to dinosaurs and not known uh very widely for being trained exactly people uh, don't realize that you can train you can train crocodiles yes. you can train fish yeah you, you can, can train, train all sharks sorts of you train sharks we had our alligators trained so well at the aquarium that they could come just at the call of their name mm -hmm. so you can train animals 
precisely and to do complex things for their own safety and your own benefit of when we need you to move somewhere, we can just teach you to go there so that when it's time to do it, you already know how to go there. And now the only difference is you get moved. Yeah. Guns and cattle prods are the opposite of yes. getting an animal to uh, cooperate and behave. I'd love to see a version of this where the dinosaurs are trained yes, to respond to things and they come when their name is called. Yep. We, we don't use negative reinforcement when training the animals <laughs> uh, because negative reinforcement doesn't actually work in the long term. It just teaches them to avoid, not to do mm -hmm. what you wanted them to do. So you always use positive or neutral reinforcement. Speaking of raptors, if I remember correctly, <laughs> uh, what's next? Yeah, I was right. The raptor feeding. <laughs> so uh, same location later in the film, uh, the crew goes over uh, Hammond and, and co bring the visiting paleontologists uh, to go see the feeding over at the, the Velociraptor enclosure. And uh, this is what that looks like. <laughs> There's so much wrong with this. What's wrong? I What what could possibly be wrong with this, with with this, this scenario? This, this precise, like a swish watch. <laughs> precision oh. procedure here. At, first off, typically, you don't feed live prey. Yes. You don't use live prey. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. Cruelty is one reason. That's sure. That that, is, this cow is not having a good time. This cow is going to suffer in this act. And yes, that is what would happen in nature. But if we are going to be keeping animals, we also are responsible for the animals we're feeding to animals. So yes. that that is unnecessary uh, uh, pain and suffering for the prey animal. So we don't usually use live prey unless it's yeah. absolutely required. Like insects for certain animals need to be moving. Sure. Also, uh, and this is sort of the flip side that you don't often think about, uh, it's also dangerous for the animals you're feeding. Absolutely. That cow has a full-on set of horns. Yes. It's still got a full, full set of it's horns. horns. It's huge. It's big. It's cow's healthy. Big. It's big. Yes, it is a big, healthy cow. That, that cow's going to fight. Prey fights back. Absolutely. You so know, that could be dangerous for your animals. Even a mouse will fight back if you feed it to a snake and could take an eye out easily they yeah. have sharp teeth so you don't want to feed live prey that mm -hmm. now you could end up with an injury even though you now have a full animal like they're fed but they now need to go to the vet so live prey is not good you've also put in a whole bunch look at all that fabric yeah. and metal and chains and stuff how much of that is now inside the raptor's belly mm -hmm. how much of that got swallowed while it was tearing it out of this packaging that you put it in yeah, like, it has to unwrap the food. Yeah, uh, you, you don't need to gift wrap well, the they meal. Can, they can open doors. Maybe they <laughs> maybe they can. Yes. Yeah, you know, very very precisely and politely. Although, uh, evidence to the contrary. Like, when we give animals things for them to play with and get to the food inside, we, we don't do it with stuff that will hurt them. <laughs> we do it with things that it's okay for them to tear into. We'll do it with pieces of hide or mm -hmm. pieces of you know, decomposing things that they can potentially swallow and will be okay. So you can feed them in a controlled way. Once again, training. Yep. The croc there knows to come up. You will see this at places when you go, when they feed crocs, that they will go to the spot and they will gather because they know that's where the food is. And so you can signal them for feeding. You don't have to hand it out carefully and right. be no you just teach them sit here and you'll get food if you don't sit here then we'll just wait until you like i can outweigh you i'm being paid to be here eventually you'll sit in the right spot and get food and we won't have to chase you and you won't chase us yeah and we're circling around uh, a point that the the zookeepers of the film uh seem to have overlooked uh, which is that dinosaurs are animals. They're animals. They're not monsters. They're animals. You could you could just try. They're animals just like birds, just like crocs. Uh, the film, definitely, the, the way the zoo, this is a zoo built to contain movie monsters. Yes, exactly. And so they're, they're making a lot of mistakes in the zoo uh, because they are not treating their animals like animals. And you may be thinking, but we have the line in the movie of T-Rex wants to hunt, not be fed. Maybe that's True. why they use the live goat and the live ox. The picture here at the tigers is a great. We can make feeding interesting. Yeah, we can sim make it something engaging. Yes. Make it something exciting. We can hide the food. We can put it in hard to reach spots. 
we can put it, you know, freeze it. We'll do that for a lot of uh, uh, aquatic animals is freeze it and they have to wait for it to thaw or break the ice apart. Yeah. Yeah. And the other scene in the movie, they bring the goat yes. into the T-Rex enclosure, which has the same <clears throat> same issue sort of issue. Also, it always makes me think of one of my favorite things that I learned from you from your time at the aquarium. Uh, would you like to explain that? The biggest issue with feeding live prey is what if they don't eat it? Right. What if that T-Rex decides that it's not hungry, it yes. doesn't want to go, so it just leaves the goat? Yeah, it just doesn't want to eat the goat. It could be that the T-Rex is sick. It could be that it's not interested. You don't know what might be going on. Mm -hmm. It decides not to eat the food you gave it. Now you have a new animal in that enclosure. Now, by AZA standards... You have to uh, take care of that. Now you have animal. to take care of that goat. <laughs> that is now, now that your goat. Now that goat is your goat. So if what like <laughs> you're gonna run into problems. What if that cow gets loose from the harness and you just have a cow wandering yep. around in the raptor enclosure and the raptors go, Well, I don't want to mess with a free cow. Right. What now you have to handle that cow. Now you have to handle that you cow. You either have to go in and get it, Do you or think you have to take care of it. They would lower a bunch of grass. Yes. Yes, in a harness. Uh, in a harness. <laughs> For the cow. So it's just not <laughs> not a good idea. Let's continue uh, in our review. Now, here, this is a classic scenario uh, to deal with. At a zoo, an animal gets sick. Yes, that happens all the time. Now, in this uh, highly scientific procedure. <laughs> so in this uh, point in the movie, uh, the crowd, the, 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 the protagonists are gathering around this triceratops uh, who has fallen ill. We hear from the doctor on site that this is a recurring issue. And then uh, Dr. Sattler uh, tenaciously uh, dives into uh, the poop. Yes. What stands out to you uh, as problematic here? There's a few things. One that we already mentioned of the Triceratops seems to be in no form of enclosure. Uh, yeah, the people do just walk right up to the Triceratops. Yep. <laughs> they get out of the Jeep. And just walk over to it. Just walk over to it, which, which you, typically you don't want. Yeah, even in situations where you can like be in a vehicle near animals, you're not supposed to get out. Yes. And you never <laughs> are supposed to just walk up to the animals. They needed locking mechanisms. On, on the, vehicle, the doors. vehicle doors. We've seen this movie. So that's one. And But the biggest issue is that they have a sick animal and the people whose job it is to take care of the animal seem utterly baffled and need very confused a non-employee to step <laughs> in which you know movie protagonist powers sure has the knowledge to save the day but they seem utterly stumped as to what to do with this animal which indicates they don't have the knowledge to care for this animal potentially they're either lacking that information which is dangerous or they have not been monitoring this animal Right, which is what it seems like from what they say that the animal gets sick, they don't quite understand, it seems to get better, and then it gets sick again, but they don't seem to be responding to it other than when it gets sick right. instead of doing regular checkups. This is another uh, a similar tied in moment in this scene in the film. Uh, this is where Dr. Grant and the kids uh, discover uh, that there are eggs. Mm -hmm. Eggs with a so. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, spoiler alert, uh, the dinosaurs aren't supposed to breed. No. Nope. The whole idea is that they engineer the dinosaurs when they are creating them, uh, growing them in the tubes, uh, to make them all female. Yes, so that they can't have any breeding and unexpected young. The logic being that you won't have any breeding out there. And then it turns out that uh, through... Uh, th they're, they're parthenogenetic, yes. but frogs. They are able to uh, breed and... Uh, lay eggs and such and it is discovered in this moment where grant and the kids have been uh, become loose in the park uh and stumble across uh this little nest of eggs with little baby raptor footprints yeah. walking away from it which uh is very reminiscent of what you were just saying yep because eggs can't be laid and hatched the same day <laughs> <laughs> it it should take uh, some amount of time for eggs to develop. So this raptor has to have been carrying eggs for a time. And also, if they are changing sex, which is the explanation in the film, yes, that probably happened at some point. Is no one checking up on these dinosaurs? So are you not checking them, weighing them, doing blood work, <clears throat> any sort of medical procedure at real zoos and aquariums? 
there is constant medical updates. Just like going in for a checkup at the doctor or the dentist to just get a cleaning and check for cavities. We do the same thing with the animals. We're just every so often, they're on a schedule. Every so often we bring you in, we weigh you, we take some blood work, we check you know, teeth there with the lion. We might check problem areas like hooves that mm -hmm. could get uh, injured very easily and just see, how are you doing? Is there anything we need to adjust? Are you above the weight we would ideally like? Are you below the weight we'd ideally like? Do we need to start increasing your intake or decreasing it? In this facility, clearly, uh, it seems like the animals were being put out into their enclosures and then just sort of yeah. left to... All right. We're not going to get close for feeding. We're and not going to get close for wellness. Checks. Nature will find a way, I guess. <laughs> and then, uh, and they do, they say in the film uh, throughout the franchise, uh, that they're too dangerous to get close yeah. to. The raptors are attacking the fences. Uh, there isn't a relationship built up between the keepers uh, and the animals being kept there, which is an important part of AZA. Absolutely. And you can do a checkup with a dangerous animal without putting yourself in danger. All of these pictures are happening through a fence. Mm -hmm. The only time we typically do checkups with an animal where the animal is right next to us is if they are a very small animal, like a little penguin. Sure. Or when they have been sedated and they are unconscious. Right. Which is another thing that we can do. Yes. Uh, that can be useful for transport, depending on what it is, uh, is that you can give them carefully administered medicine mm -hmm. that makes them a bit sleepy. Like if you go to the vet uh, for your pet and then you move them or you do the thing yes. you have to do. But this is also where that training comes in is if you can just train them of, hey, can you put your paw on the fence and then you'll get a treat. We do that, but then next time we do it, we're also going to take a little bit of blood or we're going to give you a shot. Right. But you already know how to do the thing we need you to do for that checkup. It's just part of your feeding routine. Yeah. So, so far, uh, recommendations, uh, better enclosures. Yep. Uh, you wouldn't have the animals uh, getting out. And They'd stay where you put them. They'd stay where you put them. Uh, you should really be keeping up with the animals. Yes. Uh, you. It shouldn't happen that an animal changed sex and nobody at the park noticed it. No. Uh, you should be checking up on those animals. Uh, those eggs shouldn't have been a surprise. Uh, and feeding. Feeding procedures uh, should be improved. Yes. Uh, but we've got more. Oh, we do. There is more. What is next on the list? Now, uh, <laughs> this is from Jurassic World. Yes. Uh, the second attempt at uh, the park within uh, the film franchise. Now, this is a moment that stands out for me. Uh, the, the original few Jurassic Park movies came out uh, when we were young. Yes. Right? We were kids. Uh, and it was fun, exciting. This movie came out, uh, I was an adult, uh, and I had a bit better of a sense mm -hmm. of, you know, I had worked in educational facilities before. I remember being in the theater, and when this, this scene came up, and I went, oh, no, 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 Ooh. no, no, no. <laughs> I makes, worked with the public. <laughs> that makes me so very uncomfortable. So yes. this... This is a, uh, it's not a ride, it's, uh, but it's, it's a, it's a experience, mm -hmm. an opportunity offered at Jurassic World where you can get into these little hamster balls that you can drive around and you go out like a safari mm -hmm. into the space where all the dinosaurs are. Uh, and then chaos ensues, uh, as it, it was almost certainly going to ensue. Yep. I don't like this. It's it, everything. It makes about me it. so uncomfortable. <laughs> it, this device is you know, a marvel of engineering and whatnot. Uh, and its utility here is terrible in all <laughs> regards. First off, you have given control of it over to children. These are our children. These are children who are just driving the thing around. There's no adult here. And you've just gone, yes, you can drive uh, here, you know, even though out on the roads, you wouldn't be able to. Sure. You've also just release them among your animals right. and that animal we see an animal fall over yes and get, get hurt. hurt because of this device this is a stampede <laughs> they caused by speeding up in the group of dinosaurs yes like the dinosaurs were calm and m moseying around and just chill and they incited this stampede so this is clear like a clear case of animal endangerment. Yes, they are putting You're the animals in danger. Putting the animals in danger. You're putting your guests in danger. Absolutely. They weren't given any instructions when they, like, we no, see them get in and there's no, like, here's the rules. Yep. Here's the, you know, you have to sign a wave. Nope. It's all right. 
Goodbye. Goodbye. And then Jimmy Fallon. Uh, and then Jimmy Fallon gives you science facts. Uh, tells you about science, distracting there, you while you're driving. There's also no way to get them back. No. Which I always thought was very funny. They ignore the, the call back. Yeah, they are called back <laughs> and they're like, nah, and they just drive out into the. I this. worked at a facility <laughs> that was just a little arcade attached to a movie theater, and we had go karts. We had switches that could turn the go karts off. There was a, I uh, uh, was not too long ago at a store that has those shopping carts mm-hmm. that if you take them outside the store, they lock up. Yes. And they close down. Yep. What are you doing with shopping carts? Like, this is not, you have this technology would not to pass. make a gyro, spe- a, a gyro stabilized hamster ball, but it can't be remote controlled. Right. From a distance. This is, this is just, just bad you all around. Not going to get away with that. There are safe ways to let guests yes. be near the animals, but keep things safe. You have guided tours, like the safari truck you see there, mm-hmm. where a driver, a you know staff member, drives guests around an area where you have animals that it is safe to be nearby, and the driver knows how to handle the vehicle near them. Mm-hmm. And you have things like national parks, where there are driven areas where the guests can interact. But usually, you'll also have park rangers that can come to intervene or help when a situation comes up, and they are given strict instructions as to what you do and don't do while on the road. Yes. This would be super cool to see in your Jurassic World, where you have a big out area where there's a guide who drives you around and shows off the dinosaurs. Yes. And the people who made this park uh, had, like, they had seen safaris, and they went, I get it. And then they did it. But they did. They should have talked to some zoo professionals. Yep. You used to do boat tours. Yeah. Uh, at the aquarium. And we had a captain on the boat who knew the rules of how you interact while near dolphins. Mm-hmm. How close you're able to get. You know, one of the things that people don't realize, you can't approach the dolphin. If the dolphin comes near your boat, you can't stop that. The animal doesn't like this giraffe. It. Exactly. That, that, that giraffe wants to come say hi. But you do not drive up to the giraffe. You drive to an area and you observe the animal. And if they come over, you stay stationary. You're not allowed to drive your hamster ball as fast as you want <laughs> toward the animals. That's a uh, bad uh, procedure. Yeah, because that's dangerous for the animal. It could also just be stressful and scare them, inciting a panic like we saw. But also you could put yourself in a dangerous position if that animal didn't want you nearby. Yeah. And it reacts and, and and that is what happens eventually in that yes. scene with the with the hamster ball is that they get attacked. Yes. And it gets broken. So like you don't approach animals that don't want to be approached for many reasons. <laughs> uh we're going back uh to perhaps the most famous scene. Yes. Uh in the, the film franchise. This scene, so what's at this is after uh, the Tyrannosaurus has gone through the no longer electrified fence and across the non-existent moat out here and starts messing with uh, this Jeep. And it nudges it and it knocks it over and it starts uh, playing around. Now, in the film, the the tension of the movie, you know, this is a very tense scene with uh, some people being terrorized by a scary thing. I see it. I see it differently. Yes, absolutely. I agree. I see a bored animal. This, I, this is like a dog playing with toys. Yeah, this is a dog that's interested in this new chew toy that it's not experienced. Clearly, uh, this Tyrannosaurus is not getting enough enrichment and engagement in its enclosure. And I think that's what this best shows is that this is this seems much more like curiosity than animalistic need to feed, which. Uh, and to sort of take a step back into the the, the even more meta of it, uh, I love this scene. Yes, for that reason. Yes, I love that they show the T Rex being kind of curious mm-hmm. about it, investigating, uh, playing. Obviously, it's dangerous. Oh yeah, right? like you're the food inside the toy. Oh, it's it's like if you've ever seen a person near like a, a gorilla and the gorilla may just be interested, but if the gorilla does this too hard, you need to go to the hospital to reset that shoulder. Right. Or like a cat playing with, it might just be playing with that mouse, but that's bad news for the mouse. Yes. But I love how much the, the Rex is demonstrating this sort of curiosity and almost playfulness. Uh, it is in need of enrichment. Absolutely. And that's one that we we don't get a detailed look at all the enclosures of all the animals but a lot of them seem to be 
fairly uniform and just the habit, the habitat that you would expect them in, but there's not a lot to for them to engage with. Right. They actually do talk about that with the Indominus yes. in Jurassic World, that it's by itself and there's uh -huh. basically nothing in there to do. That with animals, especially intelligent animals, you give them engagement. We give them toys. We give them toys. This could be a way to feed them, but it also might just be a toy. Balls and, you know, odd mm -hmm. structures for them to mess with. Stuff for physical exercise yes. that they can pull on or pick up. Or for mental exercise. Absolutely. They can they can sort of solve a puzzle or figure something out. Well, because they can get uh, uh, stuck when they are in a same routine every day, just like we can. Mm -hmm. Where, like, if you have nothing breaking up your day-to-day, -day, you can get stuck to where your brain literally won't be as flexible. It won't be able to solve just, problems. Just like solve. exercising yeah. your muscles. Your brain can get stuck in that routine. It can get out of it again, but it, it can, you know, when you come to that critical moment, you might not be as quick on your feet. We want to make sure the animals also don't get stuck or and and in a rut, so to speak, of just behavior. So yeah. we give them things to add up, even smells, just putting yeah. new smells around the habitat. If you were going to give some enrichment uh, for a Tyrannosaurus Rex in its enclosure, what would you give it? I think I think hiding some food uh, in like a log, like mm -hmm. give it a log that it needs to just tear apart. Yeah, some to smelly food. food. Yes, T Rex had really... a very good sense of smell, and so it could spend some time seeking it out. Well, it's like one of the facts Lucas loves to share is that tigers love Taco Bell seasoning. Uh, <laughs> that they, that's one of their favorite scents. It gets them going. So like, yeah, put some seasoning on it that won't be too much for the, the taste or stomach of the T-Rex, but will be very aromatic to it. You could also, and I know this is a thing you do, uh, going back to our raptor feeding, take some of that fabric that was in the enclosure when they ate and put that fabric in the T-Rex enclosure. Yes. Something new, the smells mm -hmm. of other animals, the smells of other dinosaurs. We used to have to, to sort of give it something different to interact with. We used to have the summer camp kids uh, decorate paper bags for our uh, snakes because mm -hmm. you know, snakes like to get in stuff and they like to be in enclosed areas. So a paper bag is great because they can get in there and if they go to the bathroom in or they make it messy, you just throw the paper bag away. But having the kids make them made them all smell like different people. Yes. So it was a new scent for the snake to experience. And it's just changing up the routine, giving them a little bit more of an experience. Uh, so scents would be great to play with. Uh, I also heard of a place that would run water from one habitat of an animal into yeah, another yeah. habitat. So you would get the smell in the water. Like you're downriver mm -hmm. and you can smell what's coming down, which is pretty cool. Yes. So well, especially if you're giving predators the sense of different prey items, Sort of get them excited, get them looking around. Yeah. And then you can hide food. You can place it at different places. Put it up high. It's a T-Rex. Yeah. Make it reach for food. Put it on ropes and let it pull them off. Put food in there inside a Jeep. Yes. Yes. And have it uh, mess with the Jeep. I think we've got one more thing uh, to point out. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of the root thing. <laughs> this, this is sort of the root of the problem. So here is our staff that we see. Again, this is Jurassic Park. Specifically, in our top left, we've got our consultants, mm -hmm. our paleontologists, Drs. Grant and Sattler, and our mathematician, yep. uh, Dr. Malcolm. Who aren't even truly staff. Who are not <laughs> staff. They are brought in to consult after, after. <laughs> after the park is basically operational. Yep. <laughs> they, they made the entire park, then brought in paleontologists yes. and scientists to help out, uh, which seems like... The, the wrong order. Yes. Uh, in our top right, we've got uh, Mr. Arnold. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on to your butts. Who is the IT person? Yes. The uh, tech specialist. Tech specialists. We have at 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 a, a whole two of them. Yep. At least two. At least two tech specialists <laughs> are present uh, here. One of which uh, is not being paid. Yes. Uh, apparently, very well. Not enough by his standards. We've got uh, your geneticists down here in the bottom left, your lab people, the people who are actually doing the work of making the dinosaurs happen. Uh, and then uh, uh, whatever Zoo needs, a uh, big game hunter. Man with gun. The man with a gun. <laughs> uh, clearly there are some things uh, going wrong with the lineup that we have here. 
the one big thing that I see that's missing is there's no zookeepers. There's no zookeepers at the zoo. There's not a vet. There's not an animal specialist. There's a person who knows how to kill animals. Sure. And a person who knows how to make animals. Right. And people who know how to study dead animals. Yep. Not one of those deals <laughs> with breathing animals. It's, it seems like the, the biggest advice that we could give on how to correct this zoo experiment and how to make Jurassic Park a better zoo would be to have zoo professionals. Yes. Uh, it is very, we've often been asked of like, if dinosaurs came back, do you think then like your degree would become all that much more useful? And it's like, no, right. I would talk to a safari person. Right. Go talk to a zookeeper. Right? Yeah. Like someone who takes care of a, a nature preserve in Africa. That's who you want if to somebody, teach you about these large, powerful animals. If someone comes up to me and they say, hey, there's a dinosaur rampaging mm -hmm. around the city. What can you do about it? And I'm going to be like, bring me its femur yes. and I'll tell you what species it is. Uh, what kind of teeth <laughs> Show me does the teeth. it have? But I, was, I don't know how to take care of a, mm -hmm. a large animal situation. Nope. Uh, so we are uh, the hiring. It started It started right up at the front. Yes. And that that is the the... Bottom line, like you said, they made a park for monsters because they hired people for monsters. For making monsters and killing monsters and controlling monsters. Yes. They did not hire a staff to care for animals. Dr. John Hammond, or not Dr. Mr. John Hammond. <laughs> so sorry. I was sorry. Sorry to uh, insult. There were a lot of doctors on screen. There are a right lot now. of doctors on screen. Uh, John Hammond, uh, several times throughout the film, says that they spared no expense. Uh, having reviewed the evidence of this uh, zoo and its flaws, seems like a lot of expense was spared. Yeah, you did not. Seems like you could have spared less expense. Yes, yes. You you could have you could have done a bit more. You probably could have even done more with less <laughs> compared it's to true. who you did decide. That <laughs> army of guys you hired. Right. You probably could have saved money hiring a zookeeper for each of those. <laughs> yeah, probably a zookeeper is cheaper. Like the mercenaries. mercenaries. <laughs> yeah, those guys are probably, they're probably really like, eating into the budget. And there he is, uh, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. John Hammond. Uh, Jurassic Park is a super fun movie. Uh, Fantastic film. We love Jurassic Park. We are here, of course, uh, to have fun uh, a little bit at the fictional character's <laughs> expense. But our point stands, and this, uh, we hope, uh, we have demonstrated uh, that Jurassic Park could have been done. Yes, there are ways to have to that they could have made it work within this fictional. Obviously, uh, we can't clone dinosaurs. No, but stepping over that point, once you have them, there are uh, they the AZA could have done it. There would have absolutely be unique challenges to keeping dinosaurs because there are some dinosaurs unlike animals today. But we have figured that out with the like we didn't know all of this the first time we tried to keep an animal we've learned it and gotten better and we are updating every year we would have learned and most of them would have fallen right within the categories of animals around today yeah. i think it's fascinating to think about what sort of challenges we might unexpectedly come yes. across Do, is this is this species of dinosaur prone to certain diseases mm -hmm. we didn't know about do these just can't they can't be sedated for it's, some reason is a triceratops more like a bison or an elephant right you know, behaviorally or socially yeah but uh our advice for the people who don't exist that make the park <laughs> uh jurassic park and who made the park jurassic world next time uh when they make jurassic mall yeah uh or whatever they decide to make uh we will be submitting our report uh to uh talk to the aza people uh, and make a good zoo. Yes. Jurassic Park. Uh, great movie. Uh, super fun premise. Mm -hmm. uh, inspirational. Very exciting. Terrible zoo. Bad zoo. Bad zoo. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we have time, I believe, uh, to take questions. Uh, so we can turn it over to our moderators to make sure that that starts happening. Uh, before we do that, a couple of quick notes. We are, again, mm -hmm. uh, the hosts of the Common Descent podcast. Our little logo is there on the thing. If you're interested, please check us out. And also, uh, shout out to our friend Lucas, yes. uh, who made the slides. Yes. Uh, we put this together, uh, uh, this presentation for another event a while back with our friend Lucas, who is also a zoo and aquariums guy. Uh, and so these slides are all basically all lucas's creation yes so. he has a podcast himself called sprites of life which yes. is a video game science uh discussion podcast yes uh and with that uh we're happy to turn it over to whoever we turn it over to
Okay, I guess I'll take it. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, that was really fun to listen to. I loved. Uh, yeah, I loved it. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, really good in depth about why Jurassic Park is a good movie. But maybe they should have hired at least one zookeeper. Uh, uh, so I haven't got a lot of questions yet, but yeah, definitely audience, if you're listening in, if you have any questions, throw it out there. Type in the chat. We'll read read it to uh, Will and David. Uh, there was. Let's see. From Tyrannotherium, if Jurassic Park is not a good park, do you think the employees are not cleaning the dinosaurs? Oh, there's no way they're cleaning the dinosaurs. Well, and and we see that a bit. There's just <laughs> two about that. giant piles of Triceratops. There dropping. are two giant piles of poo. And like, yes, you know that will happen in certain, you know, like if you have them in a big habitat, there's gonna that's, be. That's not how much a Triceratops would be pooing at once. No, that looks like it's as a recurring. Yes, like a uh, drop off situation. You still have to clean, even if you're in an outdoor habitat. That's that's not enough. There's not enough dung beetles there to t yeah. handle that much i remember in the book there's a lot of description about the terrible breath of the uh, yeah. predators mm -hmm. now i don't know how much you can control the terrible breath of a predator yes that might just be how they said that maybe that's just how you smell but we will do like teeth cleanings and stuff for animals and ju again just like you would do for your pet mm -hmm. you know at their teeth and honestly there are more strict standards for caring for animals in captivity through the AZA than there are for caring for your pets. Like yeah. animals in a zoo are probably being taken care of better than you're taking care of your pet because they have all these guidelines. Well, and that's why you see like a lot of the records for age of an animal are zoo animals because yeah, they have free health care and free meals. Yes. And the, also they're monitoring their yes. age and everything. Like you have a way to me measure it and they're going to live better and longer because they have the best care that they could. I don't know how dinosaurs clean themselves. Probably by like rolling around in the dust or going into the water. Yeah. Uh, which does mean they need to have water in their enclosures. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that raptor enclosure doesn't have any water it in it. It didn't look like it. doesn't it. seem like there's going to be a lot of space for like a, a river to flow through there or anything. Yeah. We just didn't see the scene where they lower a bucket down on it. Well, there's a, a little chain. there's a little car wash <laughs> and they just walk through it and it's got the things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Where's their watering bowl? They don't have I've, one. I've always found that raptor enclosure so weird because it's like that's very small. That is a very small space that you show us. Unless and that's supposed opens to be up. three of them in there. Three and they're in the movie, their velociraptors, yeah. which are too big, are wolf sized yes. animals. They, they are, are big. Yeah, our weight, if not a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And yet yeah, for it. For a tiger, you need multiple acres. Right. A single tiger. If you're going to have multiple tigers, you need like twice that much. Uh, you need to double it basically for each tiger you add. And it's both front of house for the guests to see and a back holding area. Yeah, they need to have a space for them to go and disappear either when they don't want to be outside anymore. Yep. Or if it's time for checkups yes. or feeding or, or something. Or if we need to clean the habitat. Or if you have more than one animal and they're not getting along, yeah. If they're not, if they're fighting, you go all right. You're gonna hang out out front, which you're in timeout. That was that's another thing is that they do say that they let this new Velociraptor into the enclosure and then she kills most of the other ones. That probably should have stopped at once. And they just went. <laughs> they went out there. Darn it! One. Yeah. Investment oh. out the window. Well, I just thought like they said like yeah, the big one killed multiple others. There's three and it's already crowded. How many were in there? Yeah. They were packed yeah, in like they two. say, well, they say we bred eight originally, mm -hmm. I think they say. And then she killed all but three of the others. Uh, so, yeah, there were supposed to be more than yeah. half a dozen, so, presumably, in that little well, enclosure. Maybe they're paying off student loans and can only afford a studio apartment. Right? Yeah. I also always wondered, how are guests supposed to see the raptors? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I, I, we don't see a... like. I, I, I guess I kind of always, and there may be like an actual canonical explanation mm -hmm. for this somewhere in the deep lore that I'm not familiar with. But when I was younger, I always assumed that it was just that they were deemed too dangerous yes. to be in a public enclosure. So they were off to the side somewhere. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'll get back to other questions. Uh, there was a comment from James saying uh, he's laughing at instead of plot holes, it was plot fences. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. And then from, Pet, <laughs> Petra Irene, Irene 
how are the glass balls so clean when they're driving through the vegetation and mud? So I guess the gyro gyrosphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're coated in oil. Yeah, well, it's the um, oh, the, it's that that uh, Rain-X that you can put on your windshield. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, those those would get so dirty and scratched up. Like the yeah. first person that finds a you know gets stuck against a rock and just keeps it's not working and just. Right glass cutters align all the way around <laughs> they are a very fun idea for a movie scenario i cannot imagine that making it through like you'd get caught on safety concerns you'd get caught on maintenance concerns if you tried to pitch that in an actual scenario yeah. i think every department in the institution would have some problem with those gyrospheres yeah yes i can imagine Okay. Um, from another from Tyrannotherium. Uh, guessing it's relating to enrichment, but are reptiles playful? Ooh, very good. Great question. question. Yeah, it varies. Mm -hmm. um, they are generally not playful the way that we think of being playful uh, as mammals. Yes, right? play is a thing that mammals do, uh, and you see it with kittens and puppies and and all sorts of stuff. Reptiles can be curious. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be interested. They can be investigative. Inquisitive. They can be inquisitive, like you were mentioning with the snakes putting in different uh, things for them to investigate. Certain species of snakes, I always love to say, my go-to example is mambas. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've ever seen mambas, green or black mambas at an enclosure, uh, like a reptile house or something, I've never seen a mamba sitting still. Yeah, they're I, always they're moving. always moving around. They're always investigating the enclosure, so they can be very active. They can be very curious. Uh, and then I know that uh, frogs. Yeah. Dot dot dot. Will says something. Yes. Uh, no. Absolutely. You'll see that with crocs where they will investigate smells, and they also will like to bite on things that aren't their food. Uh, like we would give our croc, our, our gators, um, you know, we would freeze like alligator biscuits, which are basically like dog treats, but for gators, like we'd freeze those so that they had to wait from the thaw or bite through it. But we'd also just give them pumpkins mm -hmm. and like gators can eat fruit. We found that in their stomach content before, but that that's not what they usually are going to be eating. And it definitely doesn't taste like their food, but they love them. Yeah. They love the pumpkins, whether it was the sensation of biting, but they would go after them and they would carry the pumpkin around in the water. They didn't just bite it and go, oh, I'm done. It, no, yeah. they'd bite it and they'd hold it. They would hold, you know, if we gave them, a, a, we'd give them rats, you know, dead rats. Mm -hmm. They would often just hold on to that for a little bit. Whether that's play, whether that's, I'm not hungry yet, but I want it. I want no, it. One, no one takes it. I, I don't want anyone. It's hard to say, you know, like what does a happy alligator look like, you know, versus a, right. You know, they don't emote and have potentially the same feeling. We don't know. And, but you would see that interest. Yeah. They were definitely interested and engaged in a curious way. And it's interesting to think about with dinosaurs. Obviously, every group of animals is going to be different. Mm -hmm. The closest reptile, you know, classic reptile relatives of dinosaurs are gators and crocs. Mm -hmm. And we know do stuff like that. And then the actual closest relatives of those ancient dinosaurs, uh, our living dinosaurs, are birds. Birds. And birds absolutely play. Yes. Uh, there playful. are absolutely birds like parrots and, and crows that are known to be playful. There are a lot of birds that are social, that are inquisitive. Where Velociraptor and Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops would fall within that, we don't know, but it's a safe bet that they would be somewhere between those two. Yeah, because so you, you absolutely could yes. get. I'd be a little bit shocked if Velociraptor wasn't mm -hmm. inquisitive and somewhat something like playful. Yes. No, I agree, and like you definitely could have dinosaurs that might be less playful because there are mammals. Like there's lots of herbivores, oh, sure, and that. They just they, that that's not really how they interact with things. Uh, Triceratops might have just been like, eh, you know, mm, I'll yeah. I'll push a ball out of my way, but other than that, but even a lot of those like predators are what we all often think of as being playful: otters and dolphins and yeah, tigers and dogs. And, yep. But it, look up a video of uh, bulls playing, and like I've seen tons of them of them like flipping hay bales and rhinos bumping things around with their horn. Like there's tons of playful herbivores, so. 
you could absolutely have a playful sauropod. Yeah. Know? Oh my goodness. Right. Elephants. Elephants are super inquisitive and playful. So like a big animal absolutely can be very, very mischievous. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Well, and I was saying I've been to zoos where like one time, one zoo I went to, I think it was the Edmonton Valley Zoo. Uh, they misordered the number of cabbages they need for some of their animals. So they ended up with like 10 times as much as they needed. And so every animal in the zoo got a cabbage. Yeah. <laughs> and some of the cats were, they, they, they could have made coleslaw after that. The cat went yeah. through the cabbage. Well, uh, and that's a great example because it's like yeah. the animals can't hurt themselves on the cabbage. Sure. You know, it's not dangerous material. They may not eat it. They might not do anything with it, which just means you have to clean up a slightly, you know, wilted like cabbage. cabbage. Yeah. yeah. Later. Yeah. But if they do have interest in it, free enrichment. Yeah. You can't hurt yourself and you can do whatever you want with this. It's not going to waste if you play with it. So we would do stuff like that all the time. Pumpkins was our go-to during like Halloween. You just give everyone Early a pumpkin. November, yeah. Everyone gets a pumpkin. You get a pumpkin, do whatever you want with it. We'll clean it out later and have a ball, have a pumpkin. <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh let's see. Other question. Emerging in Jurassic Park filmed in the T-Rex enclosure. And Oh, I said instead, uh, should they have used an Montosaurus dummy like they do with big cats and zoos? Probably a zebra instead of a Montosaurus. But uh, the question is, do you think that would work? Yeah. Yeah. I'm picturing the picture in my head is the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. Yes. But it's like a pinata. Yeah. And it's full of meat. Yeah, absolutely. For the T-Rex to... Well, and you know what else is super cool about something like that? And this will happen in zoos a lot <clears throat> is you come up with some fun way to feed the animals, whether it's people feeding them or you have something like your, your Edmontosaurus or whatnot. Uh, and if their animals are willing to do it in a place where guests can see it, now you also have engagement with the audience. Yeah. Yep. If you say yeah, at three o'clock, we're going to, you can come watch the T-Rex tear apart a fake Edmontosaurus full of meat. Everybody is going to come oh. at three o'clock and see the T-Rex tear yeah. apart your your Edmontosaurus statue. Yep, yep. Yeah. It's the same with training. It's why training can be so engaging because mm -hmm. even though you're doing important routines of like you need to remember that you have to come here and you have to follow the blue, these are really important. The guests get to see you interacting with the animals. Yes, and the animals moving around. And it's a chance to have someone standing there to then explain stuff. Yes. Hey, here's why we're doing this. Here's what's going on. Here's all, here's all the stuff that Jurassic Park didn't do. Yep. And in sort of the procedures that we're following. Uh, so that you have it. So it isn't just like, yeah, we we had some, you know, an artist came to us and they brought us this paper mache dummy and we yeah. threw it in the enclosure. No, here's all the details mm -hmm. that went into it. And here's why we do it this way. I would also want to make a, a cardboard Jeep. Uh, I, the Jeep is very funny. That would be because we I know places have done that with bears where they'll make a cardboard car oh, the, yeah. so the bear can break into a car oh. as they are want to do. Uh Give them, give them a, a. If we, if we ever, <laughs> in the thoroughly impossible situation that we ever managed to have a Tyrannosaurus Rex in a zoo, if they don't make a form of enrichment that is a fake jeep with food inside yes. of it for them to break into, it will, yeah. it will be. What, what was the point? Fire those people. <laughs> yeah, uh, that kind of relates to the last questions popping up. Is do you, it's kind of a side question, but from Jerry, do you think ever or dinosaurs will ever be recreated or cloned? You kind of answered that with that thoroughly sure, impossible. Yeah, my, 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 my very uh, flippant comment. Uh, no, no, no. We can't get DNA out of dinosaurs. It's just that's too old for it to survive. Uh, even if we do manage to get DNA out of fossils, which we can, we can get DNA mm -hmm. out of younger fossils. Uh, it's degraded. Mm -hmm. It's fallen apart. Lost a lot of the info that would you'd need. Yeah. Uh, you can't, in the movie, they're like, well, we filled in the gaps with frog DNA, which isn't really, because you don't know what the gaps are, you don't know what's going to fit in there. So there isn't really a scientifically, there, there is not really a way to clone, you can't recreate that genome that is lost. Even if we could do that, we almost certainly shouldn't do that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not for the question of, uh, are we going to, they're going to get loose and then uh, go to Los Angeles and uh, make a big mess. San Diego. San Diego. San Diego. And go to San Diego uh, and eat dogs and stuff. Uh, because as we've seen, 
that doesn't need to happen. You can make a good zoo. Um, but because that seems like a real breach of ethical treatment of animals. Yes. Uh, to genetically engineer a animal that we're not familiar with from a world that doesn't exist anymore and then expect it to survive. Well, and also to create animals, create life purely for the sake of entertainment mm -hmm. of like, these aren't animals that were already around that we are now observing. You made these for, for this purpose. Uh, yeah. And um, if it, Unless it's for just research purposes, you're not releasing them. So the only reason you could be making them is just to put them into enclosures. Yeah. So we are incapable of cloning. Uh, we, we can't clone really any extinct life. That's not really how cloning works. Uh, we won't be able to bring dinosaurs back. And if we did, we probably shouldn't do it in the first yeah. place. And uh, and they make this point in the, the books and, and a couple of movies. We, we'd never really be able to know if we did it right. Yeah, because we, we don't have the real ones to compare it to, so we wouldn't know how correct we were. Yeah, we would, we would we would make up what we think a dinosaur should be like. Yes, and that would be some sort of made up thing. Yep. Yeah. So we so, could be completely off. Fortunately, uh, they are probably never going to stop making movies about people doing it, so oh. we'll get to enjoy that. <laughs> I... Oh, uh, it's a good point about um, recreating dinosaurs from chickens, like the Chickenosaurus project. Yes, right. Uh, so this is a this is a project. Uh, uh, and there have been a number of different uh, studies that have used bird embryos, often chickens, because they're easy to work with. We understand them really well to examine what features in birds we can use to understand the development of dinosaurs. So there was, for example, there have been studies that show that if you tweak the genetics, chickens will grow teeth because yes. they've got the genes that do it. They're just turned off normally, uh, that you can get the beak to form more of a snout shape. And there has been this idea floating around that uh, if you tweak the genes enough, can you turn a chicken into something like a velociraptor? Yep. Uh, which is a fun sci-fi thought. Oh, yeah. Uh, a, a very fun premise for like a movie of yes, we tweaked too many genes and now all the chickens are dinosaurs. Um, but that's not how genetics works. Uh, they're, they're, all the pieces for a velociraptor are not preserved somewhere within the core of a chicken. Uh, we would, again, if we were to try to do that, we would be tweaking genes to make a chicken in the shape that we want. Yeah. The dinosaur to look like yes so it would be it would be again sort of fabricating we would be sculpting a chicken into the shape of a velociraptor the example i always think of is it would i'm it would what i think it was a documentary or just might have been a feature but saw the video online uh of them talking about that they strapped a a rod to a chicken so that it gave them kind of a long dinosaur tail mm -hmm. and that it, they had, had to adjust their posture and then the quote in the video was and then it walked more like a dinosaur like, all right but you've never seen a velociraptor walk because right. yeah. they haven't been doing that for <laughs> a while so you don't know that that's how it that that it does it looks like what you think right this is consistent with or this is potential evidence for what those dinosaurs yeah. might have walked like and it fit with what you expected yeah. But and it you, might be right. Yeah, and it that could might be very right. well be, be right. But saying the line <laughs> and then it walked like a dinosaur is misleading. Yes. <laughs> well, it it did it walked like a dinosaur because a chicken is a dinosaur. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it was already like walking. Off yes. balanced chicken. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh man, yeah, I, I want to describe dinosaurs that way. Off balanced chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that. That's a. I think that's a great spot to end on. Off balance chickens, because there's no more questions in the chat. Uh, I, I think have that's... one last oh, question. We have time. Just a quick question. Um, so one of the things with with the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park is obviously dinosaurs are have a global distribution, um, mm -hmm. and they are all like in this one spot in Costa Rica, this sort of subtropical paradise. So this is kind of an issue that I imagine zoos today have is that you keep animals in climates that they are not naturally used to, you know, like elephants in the middle of Alberta, for example. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, some of the techniques or, or challenges that zoos have around kind of keeping animals in climates that are not suited to them. Precisely. No, absolutely. That is a major concern. 
Uh, and some animals, there's, you know, uh, uh, clever ways you can get around it um, because, uh, you know, their air temperature tolerance might be different than like their water tolerance. Like we have penguins that were African penguins. So they could handle some of the heat that we'd get in Florida, but their water needed to be maintained colder because they were South African. So the water would have been much colder than any typical water around us. So we had to chill their water mm -hmm. and same with like the gators where we had a heat lamp and we had a heated pool. So the water was kept at a more reasonable temperature year round uh, since uh, we didn't want them to suffer any effects or have to go into full inactivity during winter when we still needed to be able to check up on them and interact with them. Um, so you have some things to like, air condition their habitat, but a lot of animals, especially, you know, like elephants or, uh, you know, cold weather animals where it's like polar bears, things like that. You just might not be able to keep them comfortable in the middle of summer. Some places that's where you have to have that back area where you can bring them back. You might bring them back all during a season. You know, we had animals that just had to go off, uh, off a uh, front of house during a season. Cause it's like, it's too cold for them to be here. They are inside, come back in a couple of months and you can see them again. Yeah. But yeah, Velociraptor lived in Asia in arid, very warm environments. So trying to keep them in, you know, Costa Rica, where it's going to be very humid, mm -hmm. might be a problem for them. Trying to keep them in a zoo in Alberta, you know, the summer they might be totally cool. But then in winter, it might just be, yeah, you're just not going to see the Velociraptors because they're staying inside where it's warm or they're hibernating yes. or they, they're just going to shut down for the cold uh there is the flip side of that which is that every now and then there are unusual examples mm -hmm. uh and one of my favorite examples <laughs> uh, of places where animals do surprisingly well yes. in some places uh and my favorite example is here in this region so we're in east tennessee east tennessee north carolina uh, we have some of the most successful red panda breeding programs here in this region. Red pandas, the one species of red panda today, lives over uh, in Central Southeastern Asia. And it's part of this interesting Southeast Asia and Southeast North America are surprisingly similar in terms of climate, in mm -hmm. terms of ecosystem. It's one of the reasons why invasive bugs and plants from Asia do so well here in North America because we have a lot of these similarities. And one of the upshots of that is that red pandas do really well in captivity in this part of North America, which yes. is an utterly bizarre thing. So I feel like you'd also have situations where you'd have your, your park and you'd be like, yeah, turns out Spinosaurus does awesome in Costa Rica. Yeah, it just, it loves it. Who knew? Who knew Who knew that that was going to be the case? Well, and there's tons of examples where animals are, it's like, as long as you have a warm spot or cold spot in their habitat where they can go cool off or heat up, you know, uh, that's why you'll see lots of times like with polar bears and uh, videos of people like with huskies, ice bath. Here's a big pile of ice <laughs> because you are typically in a colder habitat. So you can go cool off. You're not doing, you're not going to be unhealthy if you don't sit on this ice, but when you want to cool off, when you're feeling uncomfortable, here's a, a cold pack. Uh, but then the other extreme is like reptile houses. That's often why reptile houses are reptile houses is now we can maintain temperature and humidity yeah. precisely. This animal that lives in a desert. Yes. That should not be this far North or this far, you know, into a damp area, but we can maintain it here. So you don't have to try to worry about what the weather's like. We can just monitor it. Yeah. So that, then, I, yeah. I guarantee there would be some dinosaurs, especially small ones probably, that you would need them to just be indoor habitats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then my, the last note that I'll make, because I think it's a fun little end cap on that, there are some dinosaurs we probably just wouldn't be able to keep in captivity. Yes. Just like there are animals today. There are some very famous, like, great white sharks. Just we have not figured out we how just to haven't care. figured out how to do it. We don't know how to keep care of them in captivity. They are too open ocean of an animal to know what to do with walls. Right. Uh, they they don't experience them in their habitat. They don't hang out around reefs. They hang out in the open ocean and swim from continent to continent. Right. So we just can't figure that out. Big pterosaurs might be one of those where it's yeah. like Quetzalcoatlus needs to be able to fly halfway around the globe 
it right. panics if it come if it encounters a roof. Right. It doesn't know what that is. <laughs> so it, there'd be all sorts of cool learning curves. Yeah. This was me doing curves <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, I think that's a good point to end on. And like, Jurassic Park is a terrible zoo. They don't know what they don't know what <laughs> zookeepers are. Uh, they have big game hunters and scientists, but no zookeepers. They, well, they spared some expense. Yeah, they so ran they into some expense. the same issue a lot of people do is that they didn't realize that zookeeping is a profession that takes know-how and skill. Yeah. It's not just putting animals indoors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, thanks, Will and David, for showing up and giving us this presentation. And thanks to all of our listeners who tuned in for uh, the last speaker series of 2023. Uh, the virtual speaker series will return in 2024 with Emily. Will you uh, announce our next speaker? Yeah, so our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Kirsten Brink from the University of Manitoba, who is going to be talking to us about Sue the T-Rex. Uh, so you can tune in for that on January and get the date here january 20th so hope to see you there so, yeah uh, and with that uh thanks again everyone for joining us and i'll